if you've heard the names before, what people use on the web and the internet are things like DES or DES, RC4 or AES. I don't want to describe these things to you. I just want to point out that they're rather simple to describe. So for example, RC4, which is a modern encryption scheme, can be described by these two small segments of code. Because if you actually wanted to program an encryption scheme on your computer, just go to Wikipedia, get this description. And it's really just a few lines of code. So it's conceptually very simple to program and, and explain. And this is what's widely used on the internet today to encrypt large amounts of data. So encryption can be easy to design and elegant to design, but very difficult to analyze because you can't be sure that there is no shortcut to break the scheme, which we haven't thought of as yet. Okay, do I have any questions about this? Okay, so I want to revisit all these classical schemes that are used today. So remember when Jeff and I wanted to exchange a secret message? The problem was that we used a lock for which we both had the same key, right? And before I could send the message to him, I needed to give him a copy of the key. I couldn't send him the key over the internet because that would be insecure. So we had to meet in a secret room where we could exchange the key. Once we have the secret key shared, we can then send messages over the internet. So I'm going to try a second demonstration with my same volunteers, Jeff, Ed, and Dale. OK, so once again, I have a secret message I want to send to Jeff over the internet. Again, Dale and Ed are computers along the internet. And this time, though, Jeff is in Vancouver while I'm in Waterloo. Right, so I don't have the option of sort of meeting Jeff quickly on the side to give Jeff a secret key. Jeff is in Vancouver, and I want to send the email message now encrypted. So what I might use for that is I have my own key in lock here. So I have a lock with my name on it, says Alfred, you can't see it, and my secret key, which opens and closes the lock. OK, so what can I do? Jeff has his own lock, too, I think. Oh, he does, with his own name on it. OK, so maybe I'll put the message in the box And since I don't want Dale to read it, I'll lock the message, the box with my lock, which has my name on it, and give the box to Dale. The, na the name's on the other side. <laughs> Dale gives it to Ed, who, again, we don't trust. Ed gives it to Jeff. Oh, but now he can't open the box. Because I have the only key that opens the box. I would like to give Jeff a copy of the key, but he's in Vancouver and I can't quite reach him across the, oh, the, the continent. So what should I do? Let's try it again. So give me the box back. I'll take out my lock, because that didn't work. OK, so again, the message is in the box. And I want to get the message to Jeff without Dale and Ed being able to get the message. How can we use our locks? Yeah? Great idea. So why, why doesn't Jeff send me his lock? Not the key, just the lock. It has Jeff's name on it. It's just the lock. No key there. So, oh great, I put the message in the box. I locked the box, of course, with Jeff's lock. I know it's his lock because it has his name on it, which presumably can't be removed. I send the lock box to Dale, who can't open it. Ed can open it. And finally, of course, Jeff gets the box. His name is on the lock. So he uses the key, which only he knows, to unlock the box. OK, so a pretty simple idea. Thanks, Jeff, Ed, and Dale, once again. So the idea here was quite different. In the previous scenario, Jeff and I had to get together in secret to exchange keys that open and close the same lock. In this setting, we each have our own locks with our names on them. If I want to send Jeff a message over the internet, all Jeff has to do is send me his lock, not the key. No secrets. I put the message in the box, lock it with, the, with Jeff's lock, send the lock box to Jeff over the unsecured internet, and Jeff can open the lock with his secret key. Again, that's the notion of public key encryption, uh, which was discovered by Ralph Merkel, Martin Hellman, and Whit Diffie in 1975, a really r remarkably simple idea, which took a long time to actually discover. So conceptually, the idea is each person 
Jeff, for example, has two keys, a public key that's used for encryption or locking, well, and a decryption key, a, a secret key that is used for decryption or unlocking. So Alice has her own key pair. Jeff has his own key pair. I have my own key pair. If um, Bob wants to send Alice a message with confidentiality, what Bob needs to do is obtain Alice's public key, maybe over the internet. Is that a secret key so it can be sent over the internet? Um, encrypt the message somehow, scramble the message using um, Alice's public key, that's the, the locking or encryption key, send the scrambled message to Alice. Alice can now use her secret key, which only she knows, to unscramble the message. Okay, that's a remarkably simple idea, which took a long time to discover. And this is how, really, we engage in secure web communications today on the internet. So, so I want to give you two examples of how this is done roughly. I don't have time to do all the details. The main ingredient, though, that I want to describe is how Alice can select two keys, a public key and a secret key, which are mathematically related, in such a way that if, if she makes her public key public, that's, a, that's why it's called public, no one else can actually find the private key. It should be infeasible for any attacker to find Alice's secret key from her public key. That's the main ingredient need to implement a public key encryption scheme. And I'll show you this idea with two concepts, that of perfect codes and integer factorization. All right, so let me tell you what a perfect code is first. So first, a graph, as I've drawn here, not the graphs you draw on the x, y axis, a different notion of a graph, it consists of a bunch of circles in this case, black circles. Some of them are joined by lines. Some of them are not joined by lines. So two nodes, as I call them, are said to be adjacent to each other if they're joined by an edge. So for example, the nodes 1 and 2 are adjacent, while the nodes 1 and 8 are not adjacent. They, don't, they aren't joined by an edge. So given such an abstract graph, a perfect code for the graph is a collection of nodes, a special collection, having two properties. The first is that every other node in the graph is adjacent to exactly one of these selected nodes. Okay, not zero, not two, but exactly one. And the second property is that, which I didn't write down on the activity sheet, so I should write this down, uh, that no two of the selected nodes can be adjacent to each other. And that's what a perfect graph is for, this abstract thing, which I've called a graph. Can somebody give me an example of a perfect code for this graph, the cube graph? Yes? Two and seven. Two and seven. Yeah, the nodes two and seven form a perfect code because, first of all, they're not adjacent to each other. Secondly, you can check that every other vertex in the graph is adjacent to exactly one of the node two or the node seven. Another example might be the nodes one and eight. And in general, any two opposite corners of this graph form a perfect code. Okay, here's a slightly more difficult example. Can someone find a perfect code for this graph? So I want some of the nodes with two properties. Every other node is adjacent to exactly one of the selected nodes, and node to selected nodes are adjacent to each other. What's a perfect, a perfect code for this graph? Yes? Seven and eight? Just seven and eight? So if you choose seven and eight, look at the vertex nine. It's not adjacent to either seven or eight, so that can't be a perfect code, right? Just seven and eight. Yes? Seven, eight, nine. Yeah, seven, eight, nine. So let's try that. So that's my perfect code because, first of all, no two red nodes are adjacent to each other. And every other black node is adjacent to exactly one red node. For example, node two is adjacent to node seven, but not to node eight and nine. Okay, the next one is actually a trick question. So maybe I won't spend very much time on it. Find the perfect code for this graph. Yeah, there isn't one. That's a trick question. So not all graphs have perfect codes. This graph does not have a perfect code. So 
That's a trick question, so we won't spend time on this. Um, here's another graph, slightly more complicated. C can anyone find a perfect code for this graph? Yeah. Five, five, ten, and thirteen. Let's try that. See the one I have. Oh, that's the one I have too. So five, ten, and thirteen form a perfect code for the graph because again. No two of the red vertices are adjacent to each other. Well, every black node is adjacent to exactly one of the red nodes. Okay, if I had more time, I would let you try more of these examples. Here's my next challenge. So I would like you to spend 10 minutes on this, but I'm out of time. So uh, the hope is that most of you wouldn't find the perfect code in five to 10 minutes. Because that was a very easy example. This was also fairly easy, if you had a few minutes to think about it. Uh, this was a bit harder, but some of you worked it before uh, I started the, le the, the lecture, so you, you got it. This is a lot harder. There's only 32 nodes in the graph. It's not a very large graph, but it would take most of you 20, 30 minutes or more, probably, to actually find a perfect code. Did anyone actually find a perfect code? One, two, two, two folks, three. Four, yes. Five, six, okay, seven, about seven or eight of you. But this was expected to be a hard problem. In fact, it's known that this problem is so-called NP-hard. So if you've never heard the phrase before, computer scientists study a lot of problems like this on graphs. They're useful problems because a graph can model, for instance, a computer network, where the, the uh, nodes may be computers, and the edges might be links that are active between two, two such computers. And they study networks with certain properties, like how connected is a network, for example. Okay, some of these problems are very hard. And they spend years studying these hard problems, and they can't solve them. They would like to prove that the problems are indeed hard. So they've developed this notion of NP-hardness, which is a very nice notion, which when you show that a problem is NP-hard, it gives you very strong evidence that the problem is indeed very hard. And we won't expect anyone to solve those problems in our lifetime. So finding a perfect code for a graph in general is an NP-hard problem, which means it's considered to be really, really hard. And so I really didn't expect you to find the perfect code for this graph, except a few of you did find one in, in, in say, 10 minutes. Okay? Anyway, here's one of the answers. There might be more than one answer. If you want to write this down, this was the perfect code I found for this graph. So the nodes, I'll read them out. Three, three six, 10, 16, 22, 25, and I left out 13. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, so the question of interest here is how did I find this perfect code in the graph given that it's a hard problem? And the answer is I, I selected the problem myself in the following way. Right, so the way I did this was, it's not that I'm really clever, I did the following. I first created a bunch of stars. I call these stars. So star consists of a center node and some edges coming out of it to the outer nodes. Okay, when you look at a graph which consists of these three stars, it's clear what a perfect code is, right? What's the perfect code for such a star? So given such stars, what's the perfect code? Yep. The, the middle, the center, the center nodes, right? Because no two center nodes, the red ones, are adjacent to each other, while um, every black node is adjacent to exactly one center node. So this is a really easy perfect code problem to solve. Given a bunch of stars, the perfect code is just the nodes in the center. That's a perfect code. Now I want to take this easy problem making it to a hard problem. So here's what I do. I've written this down on the activity sheet. What you do is to make this look, look like a hard problem, you take black nodes, like this one and that one, and you join them by an edge. So you add a bunch of edges to make the graph look complicated, and all the edges you add have to join black nodes. They can't go from a black node to a red node, or from a red node to a red node. They have to join black nodes. And here's what I've done next. Here's the same graph as before, three stars. You see the stars now? Here's the first star, the second star, and the third star. And I've joined a bunch of random edges between black nodes. 
And the point being, I get a more complicated looking graph. This is certainly more complicated looking than the upper graph. And the punchline is that the original perfect code is still a perfect code for this graph. Because it's still the case that no two red nodes are joined by an edge or adjacent. And it's still the case that every black node is adjacent to exactly one red node. Because that was the case in the original simple graph. And I never added any edges from black nodes to red nodes. So every black node still remains adjacent to exactly one red node. Okay, so that's how I create a challenge. Draw a bunch of stars. I drew three here. For the previous challenge, I drew seven stars. And you can see the stars now. Think of the red nodes as centers. You can see the stars coming out of them. I had seven simple stars with an easy perfect code. And I randomly joined a bunch of uh, black nodes with some edges to get this complicated graph, which took most of you, you know, a very long time to find the perfect code. OK, so as an activity, which I think I'll skip, we don't have time for, uh, it's on the sheet. You can construct your own challenges in the same way. So draw a bunch of stars. Remember the center nodes as the perfect code. And then join some of the outer nodes with other outer nodes to get a complicated graph like this, like this. And at the end of the exercise, you've drawn an ugly looking graph like this one, which has a perfect code, which you know, but hopefully no one else can find. Because this is how you create problems that you have the solution to, but your teachers can find the answer. You can stump your teachers this way. Okay? So if I had more time, I would let you uh, create some challenges yourself, give them to your neighbors, and your neighbors will not be able to find the perfect codes that you happen to know. Okay, so I think I'll skip the activity in the interest of time uh, and, and tell you how this might be used now to construct a public key encryption scheme, which is my next, my next slide. Okay, this is just the outline of the scheme without the details. So remember in the public key encryption scheme, um, Alice has a pair of keys a public key and a secret key, which are mathematically related. The public key is known to everyone, while the secret key has to be your secret. So an attacker shouldn't be able to find Alice's secret key from her public key. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called a secret key. OK, so with this perfect code um, example, Alice would select a very large graph, maybe with 1,000 nodes, a very complicated graph, which has a perfect code which only she knows. So she cleverly creates the graph where she knows the perfect code, adds random edges to make the perfect code really hard to find. Okay, so then her public key is the graph. Her secret key is the perfect code which only she can find because finding perfect codes of large graphs is a very hard problem. Okay, so in my example, this is a smaller example. This would be my public key, which everyone can see, while my secret key would be the perfect code which presumably only I can find. Some of you didn't find it, some of you did, but if you didn't find it, the perfect code would be my secret key, which only I knew, namely the red, red nodes in this picture. All right, so Alice picks a graph. That's her public key. The perfect code is her secret key. And Bob now can use Alice's graph to scramble a message in a way I won't describe. Send the scramble message to Alice. Alice can then use her knowledge of the perfect code in a clever way to descramble the message. Okay, that's the further step I'm not going to give you the details for in this presentation. So that's my example, though, of how Alice can compute a public secret key pair so that when her public key is made public to the attacker, the attacker can't learn uh, Alice's secret key from it. 